in the context of our liturgy today, the hard saying that offended Jesus' disciples seems to refer to the previous reading, the chapter 5 of Ephesians, in which Paul describes the traditional relationship of Christian husband and wife. But the actual reference is to a previous section in John's Gospel, a section we would have read last Sunday, except it was the Feast of Our Lady's Assumption, and so those readings were omitted. In last Sunday's Gospel, we would have heard these words. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. This is the hard saying, seemingly impossible to do. But what do we do with hard sayings? What do we do with uncomfortable teachings, not to mention obscure parables and the occasional story from the Old Testament that seems to be filled with violence? Well, I suppose we could take the approach of Thomas Jefferson, who famously cut out pages and paragraphs of his Bible, deleting all those passages he chose not to agree with. But the words of Jesus are spirit and life. Part of what this means is that we need to read and to hear them with eyes and ears and hearts opened by the Holy Spirit, opened by the grace of God lest we take them only in a literalistic way, in a way that seems to run counter to our own experience. And a further context of today's reading from John would be the encounter that we read of in John chapter 4, the encounter of Jesus with the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. You may recall the story. Jesus sits down by this well in the middle of the day the woman comes to draw water, which is unusual because most people would do that early in the morning. And Jesus engages her in a conversation and lets her know that he understands the situation of her life, that she has had five husbands and the one she's with now is not really her husband. Well, the woman, of course, is embarrassed and ashamed of this and tries to shift the conversation to something more religious and begins to talk about worship in the temple. So when we read this situation of this woman having been so often rejected, so often shunned and made to feel worthless, disgraced and disgraded, degraded, she's just some man's possession, no better than a slave. But in that state of abjection, Jesus offers to her the most wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of new life, like living water springing up as an unending spring. And Jesus, moreover, offers her a new kind of worship, a worship not connected with a mountain or a temple, but a worship of spirit and truth. Part of this means, to me at least, that what we're being invited to by Jesus is an authentic relationship with God, authentic because it's our real life. It's not about something we think about, not something someone else told us, but something we have experienced, something we know for ourselves from our own actual life situation. To worship in spirit and truth means to discover who God really is for us and who we are with God. We human beings are made for God, and yet human beings love to make their own gods. And these are the things we pay more attention to, the things that tend to grab our attention and what we center our life upon. It's been said that if you want to know your real priorities, look at your calendar and your bank statement. What you spend your free time on, what you spend your money on, what you give your thoughts and your desires to, these are the things that are really important to you. And in some ways, these become our little gods, the little gods we've created for ourselves because they comfort us, they make us feel good, we can see them and touch them and enjoy them. But our worship as Christian men and women is to be the worship of Christ. In other words, to worship as Christ himself worshiped. We serve and reverence and honor God as Jesus himself did, in the spirit of Christ, in the example of Christ. And that, in the preaching of the Apostle Paul, so often involves us in the cross, what Paul calls the Paschal Mystery, the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
We read, for example, in his letter to the Philippians that Jesus emptied himself. He took the form of a slave. He humbled himself and was obedient even to death, death on a cross. Jesus gave himself to God for us. Jesus yielded his will to the will of God because God is love and God's will is love. Thus, Jesus gave himself, he lived and he died in love and for love. I think that's very important to emphasize that. Jesus lived and died in love and for love. That's how Jesus worshiped. That's worship in spirit and truth. And in our daily lives, we're invited to the same. And this is mostly seen in our relationships, as the apostle reminds us. This chapter of Ephesians is not just about marriage, but it goes on to talk also about family and work relationships. We could add to that school and friends and neighbors, everyone that we encounter, anyone we relate to. This is the place that we have the opportunity to live in love and for love. And this is the way we need to understand Paul's teaching, not to take it in a worldly, carnal way only, just something of the body, but to understand the deeper spirit that he is inviting us to, to live the very life of Jesus Christ, to give ourselves completely and freely, joyfully in love and for love. In the spirit and in the truth, we understand both of these readings, Paul's reading and Jesus' teaching on the Eucharist, as the gift of Christ to us. Our pure worship, this most holy sacrifice that we offer, this only offering that is worthy of God, is the gift of Jesus to the Father for us and our gift to God through him. Is this possible or is it too hard? Is it intolerable? Only those of worldly mind, I think, those who are still only set on power and pleasure and possession. But those who have been given the spirit have been called to freedom. We have been called to be free of those materialistic things so that we can appreciate the gifts of the spirit. We've been called to freedom, to the freedom of Christ, which in the eyes of the world looks like total commitment, because that's what it is. But in that total commitment, in love and for love, we find the deepest meaning of ourselves. We find who we really are, we find out who God really is, and we find what we have been destined for from all eternity. So the challenge of Joshua still rings out for us today. Choose today whom you will serve. Do we serve ourselves? Do we serve only things we can see? Or will we serve the living and true God after the example of Jesus? May the Lord's grace and the gift of the Holy Spirit be within us today calling us to give ever more of ourselves, that little by little we grow more and more in the likeness of Christ and are able to give ourselves as he did to, the, to our God in love and for love.